This is the basic concepts in geography, chapter one, key issue three, why are different places similar? Lesson one. In the first key issue, we talked about how geographers describe where things are. In the second key issue, we talked about why each place is unique on earth. Now we're gonna discuss why different places are similar. You might be able to think about some examples of changes in economies and culture that have occurred at both a local and a global scale. You recognize that human activity is rarely confined to one location. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about the three basic concepts that we can use to explain the similarities among places and regions. And these are very important terms. Density, concentration, and pattern. The location of activities and people and resources are not a coincidence. And so we want to spend some more time talking about both the local and the global scale of what we see. Don't forget that scale is a very important word. We want to look from the local and then to the global. We want to study all levels, the large scale and the small scale. We are most interested, however, in this course with global patterns and processes. What can we see that are similar and different across the globe? And this is very important because of globalization. Globaliz globalization is the process that involves the entire world. It results in making something worldwide in scope. Think about the idea that scale is actually shrinking or we have a small world. And why is that? Because of the internet, because of travel, because of how connected we are, that we can be connected via FaceTime or instant text messaging or using the WhatsApp instantly that we can get on a plane and travel to everywhere we could ever imagine in the world where people live. And so we're so interconnected that it completely changes our discussion. Globalization of the economy has been both a positive and a negative thing. Negatively, we can see the 2020 COVID-19 impact on the world, where something can come out of one region and quickly spread around the other. And the economic impact of that virus and the shutdowns in, you know, in the United States and Europe have severe consequences economically at both a global scale and a local scale with higher levels of unemployment, changing in spending, and changes in the supply and demand. We saw another global impact of the economy in 2008 when America went into a very sharp economic decline as seen here in the percent of real GDP. And a lot of this had to do with the housing bubble that had rippled through the economy, um, over spending and taking out exorbitant loans uh, that resulted in some negative impacts whenever the economy shrunk and people lost their jobs and they couldn't pay for their mortgages and then they couldn't sell their house uh, because they were worth less than what they owed. And a lot of this was led by transnational corporations all across the countries who sell and operate and, and do research and, and this really was um, a major negative uh, between 2008 um, about the middle part of 2008, the end of 2008 through 2010, the U.S. economy actually shrank for several consecutive quarters, which is really a depression. Now, we began to see the boom occur, especially in about the 2015 to 2017 years. And it's why I talked about the 2020 COVID-19 impact first, as we saw for the first time since 2000 and really in 2009, 2010, uh, slowing down of the economy although the economy has really started to pick up again here at the end of 2020. There can also be globalization of cultures, not always just the, the economy. We begin to see uniform global landscapes of material artifacts and cultural values. For instance, if you travel, you can probably find restaurants, global chains that are familiar to you. Even though the inside of the restaurant and the food and the things that they serve may be different, they have a lot in common. For instance, uh, when I was in Poland in 2000, I did go to um, a McDonald's and they had a lot of the same things like the apple pies. I also went to a pizza hut in Poland 
and they did have a salad bar and said their salad bar though was more coleslaw based and less fresh lettuce and vegetable based and part of that had to do with the price at that time of fresh fruits and vegetables so many of the things that they had served were different however their pizza tasted exactly the same and so this cultural aspect can be spread across the world mcdonald's is just one example or the north face company or subway or burger king or other well-known uh labels and restaurants that you might be familiar with. With the globalization of culture, English is actually the communication link. I know we haven't talked about languages yet, but in a later uh, chapter we'll talk about languages, in particular a term called lingua franca, or the, the unifying language. English is the unifying language of business and of the airline industry. So as tourists, if you're able to speak English, you can communicate all over the world. In reality, local culture can be threatened or local culture can flourish. It, de it determines uh, the flourishing or the threatening nature of local culture based on what is permitted and how you preserve things, right? So tourism might really preserve local culture because people want to come and learn about it. But uh, the local culture can be threatened by competing markets whenever chains like McDonald's comes in. It might be hard for smaller businesses to operate. There are three properties, as I mentioned earlier, that talk about the distribution across space. And before I define these properties, I want to talk about the term space. Space is the distribution of features. It refers to the physical gap or interval between two objects. For instance, think about the arrangement of people and activities found in space. Try to understand how these are distributed this way across space. Here's an old image of a classroom, the old desks in my classroom, that were spaced out in rows, six in a row where the desk touched the seat in front. In 2020, in the, during the COVID pandemic, you probably have uh, seen the change in the distribution of space, right? Now we're trying to keep six feet apart social distance. My classroom has 50% of the desks that it used to. They're at least four to six feet apart, so we give that adequate space. So in that particular area, the interval or the gap between two objects in my room have increased dramatically because of the global pandemic. Geographers identify main properties of distribution across the earth. Density, concentration, and in pattern. So let's define each of these. First of all, density. Density is the frequency with which something occurs in space. It involves the number of a feature and the land area. In the example that I was just talking about with desks, my room size, my classroom has not changed in size, but the frequency has. I went from having 30 desks in my classroom to 15, so the density has decreased because I have less of a number of a feature in the same land area. The second term is concentration. concentration. Concentration is the extent of a feature spread over space. Closely spaced together is known as clustered. Relatively far apart is known as dispersed. So again, with the example of my desks, they are at one time clustered together so I can fit 30 in my room but now I have them spread very far apart. They're more dispersed. Finally, pattern. Geometric arrangement of objects in space. The pattern that I used to have are straight rows. Now I have really no geometric pattern as I've completely dispersed the density of the desks. Let me spend just a second before I go on to some examples giving you some, some tips to not get the language confused. First of all, just because you have a high number of something doesn't necessarily mean you have a high density, right? Just the frequency isn't the entire definition of density. We also have to take a look at the space, the size of the area. So think number and area. Um, for instance, just because the density of something is very high doesn't mean there's also a very high rate of poverty, right? So just because you see two things going in the same direction doesn't mean there's a causation or necessarily a correlation. 
So large numbers does not always mean high density. Likewise, concentration does not always equal density. Um, objects in an area very close together, like I said, that's clustered, but you have to, to compare two types of concentration. They can have the same number of objects in the same size areas, then you can take a look at concentration. So if I have a 10 by 10 space with five cows, and in the first space, the five cows are dispersed, and the second uh, 10 by 10 space, the five cows are all cuddled together or clustered together, then we can compare the concentration of the cows in the second space to the dispersion of the cows in the first space. Uh, and so that's really important as we move through a couple of these examples that you have the idea that they are different, right? So geometric, you may see some linear. If you see houses in a row on a street, or you see the linear uh, markups of a subway station, or maybe you see a grid pattern to towns and streets, like with the land ordinance of 1785. We don't see that in the Northeast, but when you move to the West, you see that grid pattern. If you've ever flown in an airplane um, out West, you might have seen maybe from Vegas, um, or another, you know, maybe Colorado, uh, more of a grid pattern to the streets. We don't, we don't tend to see that as much in the northeastern part of the United States because um, the ordinance comes after they've already been founded and people are already uh, creating streets and roads. All right, so this is the distribution of houses, an image taken out of your textbook. There are three plans for residential areas, all are 82 acre pieces of land. The top plan for a residential area has a lower density than the middle plan. The top plan has 24 houses. For instance, the middle plan has 32 houses, but both have dispersed concentrations. The middle and lower plans have the same density. Both have the 32, 32 houses on each of these plans, but the distribution of houses is much more clustered in the lower plan. The lower plan has shared open spaces like here that this plan does not, whereas the middle plan provides a larger private yard surrounding each house. And so there may be different formats, for instance, of housing developments that are created in order to provide different scenarios. In this scenario, everybody wants about the same size yard with their houses equally distributed. In this plan, the houses are a little bit closer together. Some of the yards might be smaller, but there is some large open space for, uh, for perhaps some open fields for the kids to play or some ball fields or a community pool. Um, but what's neat about this is you can see the lower versus higher density. You can see the concentration um, of the clusters of these houses versus the concentration of the dispersal of these houses. Let's take a look at distribution of baseball teams. Uh, the changing distributions of North American baseball teams are illustrating the difference between density and of concentration. In 1952, most of the baseball teams we can see are very heavily concentrated in the Northeast to the Midwest, all in the North. Uh, in 2013, we see more of a dispersal of baseball teams, and part of that has to do with the growing trend of the popularity of the National Baseball League, uh, but also because of the growing cities and other parts that now are demanding their own home teams. How about pattern? Okay, so to facilitate the, the numbering of townships, the U.S. Land Ordinance of 1785, which I mentioned earlier, designated several north and south lines as what they call principal meridians and several east-west lines as baselines. Um, and, and you see that here, the baselines and the principal meridians. Over here on the right, we see territory farther west was settled and additional lines were then delineated. And so townships out west are typically six miles by six miles. That doesn't make sense if you live in the Northeast. Our townships do not have any type of grid or geometric shapes. Um, most of the markers used were stones and trees and rivers. Um, here in our school district, you cross a river and you're in a different county in a different school district. Um, so there isn't necessarily this grid-like pattern, um, but it does exi exist with this township and range system out west. All right, 
So now that we've spent some time talking about pattern and concentration, density, and space, this brings us to the end of Key Issue 3, Lesson 1. And this is Social Studies with Mrs. Jones.